Hello there. Thank you for joining me. This is the Holiness and History Revival, and we have got a lot of things we're going to be talking about in tonight's program. We're going to be looking at a man named Telemachus and his importance in history. We're going to be talking about mature love and how we can really navigate some of the spiritual warfare in our day and age. We're going to be looking at Revelation. We're going to be looking at Ezekiel. We're going to be talking about a lot of different points in our culture today. So thank you for joining me. And I don't remember if I've said my name or not, but I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. And if you've spent some time around here, you know that I normally have my dogs walking around. And tonight, while the main theme of our program is going to be mature Christian love, really stepping into love as Christ set before us. You know, in our modern world, we hear the word love thrown around so much by those inside the church, by those outside the church. We hear this word thrown around all the time. But what does it really mean? We're going to dive into that today by looking at some people in history. But before we do any of that, I want to start with a, a story that involves my dogs because it's actually pretty relevant. And I've got the blue healer out here with me right now. Count, you want to come here, buddy? The story doesn't fully involve him. It's really about the other dog who's, who's not with me right now. But I want to bring him over here. That way you can see him and see that he's a good boy. Yeah, so he's a real good dog. Count is great. Well... Many of you have seen my, my little white dog, Baron, who runs around here. He's kind of a long-haired chihuahua thing. and Well, Baron, he, he's shown me a lot, just like this one has. You know, God has given us a lot of tools in this world around us where we can learn about Him. And we have that old saying that dog is man's best friend. And you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, just the other day, I was sitting down at my parents' house. They live about a mile away from me. And I was down there with them, and they have a back scratcher. And I picked up this back scratcher, and it's metal, and it's one that kind of expands out, and you can use it. I pulled this thing out, and I kind of waved it around at my little dog, Baron, and he was kind of spooked by it. He jumped back. He kind of thought it was a weapon, something that might be used to give him a little bit of a chastising. And his first instinct was to have a little bit of reservation about the stick. And you know what? He was right. Somewhere throughout the deep lineage of dogs and wolves and their interactions with people has trained them that says, hey, a stick can be fun, but it can also be used as a weapon against me. So, you know, his instinct of that situation is quite correct. But I got this, this idea that come in my mind and I said, you know, the dog perceives this as a threat. I wonder how much it will take for me to get him comfortable with something that is a potential threat to him and in fact can be used against him. So I, I kind of talked to him, and it's amazing. Just using, you know, soft words, you can really calm a dog down. And I got him nice and calm, and then I came close to him with that back scratcher, and I started putting it on him in his ticklish areas. Like a lot of dogs, he's kind of ticklish right there in the top of his lower back, and he likes that. And then right up under kind of his dog equivalent of armpits, he likes you to get him there, and he's real ticklish in those spots. And I started taking that back scratcher and putting it right there in the center of his back where he likes it, and then right there on his sides, and before you long, you know what, this dog was loving it. In fact, he went from being scared of it to he came right up next to me and leaned on me like he does and wanted me to sit there and just scratch him with this. Eventually, my mother saw that I had done taking their back scratcher and running all over the dog, and she comes over there to see what the, the deal is. She don't like her <laughs> stuff that she uses on herself there on the dog. And she goes to take it away from him, and he snaps back at her. He kind of gives her a little bit of back talk because he likes this thing. He wants it to be with him. And we're kind of playing around with this, and I ask her for the, the back scratcher back, and she gives it back to me. And after a little while, Baron's done picked up his toys and stuff, and he's sitting on my feet playing with me. And every time I stop scratching him with the back scratcher, he snatches his head to look at me like, hey, what are you doing? And you might wonder, why is the preacher sharing this dog story with us on a night when we're talking about serious, immature love? Well, you see, Christ comes to us, and the gospel is a very serious thing. It comes to clothe the, poor, clothe the poor, to feed those who are in need. But it also comes to challenge evil. It comes to confront evil and say, we can't be doing that no more. All people need to step away from sin and evil. All of us are born sinners. Yes, we're made in the image of God, but we've all fallen short of that. And we need to be separated from evil. Well, the moral of that back scratcher story is, is there's a lot of things that are evil in our world, things that can be used against us, things that are really weapons of hell, things that are really destructive tools of the devil, that people come to love. They start off being a little reserved about it. You know, 
are throughout history, throughout the, the generations of, of the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, we've developed a lot of tools in our brains to tell us, you know, that's a threat over there. That's a little bit mysterious. I'm going to be reserved in that. But in our modern day and age, we've been taught not to pay attention to our natural instincts. Uh, and I'm not just talking about not to pay attention to your natural desires, because the world certainly tells us to, you know, affirm your natural desires. But the things that we are naturally repulsed by, We've kind of been told to, to, you know, open up your door, let them come on in. And in doing this, our culture has gotten really comfortable with evil. It's come to give you a nice little pet, a nice little scratch, and people are all right with it. In the same way that Baron got comfortable with that back scratcher, a lot of people have gotten comfortable with evil. And it's just a real fascinating story, a little psychological examination of how we get comfortable with evil. And in fact, today, there were some kittens that were dropped off at the church, and we've been trying to catch them so we can take them and give them new homes. And um, they were a little bit skittish at first. I put out some cheese and whatnot, and before you know it, the kittens are ready to be handled. Um, some of them, anyway. One of them was kind of mean and, and bit through my finger and shot a little bit of blood everywhere, so we'll figure it out if I get locked jaw or <laughs> something like that from the cat eventually. But it doesn't take much to get people comfortable with evil. So like I said, tonight, our main theme is mature love. Are we in the church a people who not only wants to go out to those who are unfortunate in life, those who are sick, those who are are weak, those who are poor, and clothe them, feed them? Do we want to do that while also be willing to challenge the evil in our day and age? To challenge lies, to challenge untruths, to challenge things which ultimately come to bring destruction to the people around us. It's, it's gotten to a point in our culture where if you say you're a Christian and you, you're the sort of Christian who says, well, we like to do soup kitchens, we like to do things like this that are, are kind of generally good, a lot of people who aren't Christians, they'll approve of that and say, yeah, that's the form of Christianity we want. But they don't really want people to exercise their faith to the point where they're really challenging sin. And this is where we have to understand what the love of Christ really is. And when I was opening up this program, I mentioned that we see the word love all over the place in our world. We see it in just so many different places. But one of the things we have to understand is that the concept of love itself has been perverted. And, and this is, of course, on purpose. The demons in hell, the devil, is never content to, to just let things be. The devil always wants to come and destroy things. And if the devil hears that people are going to be talking about love, he's going to come and corrupt their understanding of love. This happens both outside the church, but also inside the church. We're in trying times, folks. You have been born for an hour such as this. No matter where you're at in life, the world is going to try to sell you on things that will make you feel healthy and whole, but they really won't. They're all designed to fail. Jesus alone and his love is capable of bringing restoration and healing in our world. And the devil doesn't want to let that happen. He wants to pervert the gospel to pervert our very understanding of love. So let's talk about a man named Telemachus for a moment, because he really shows us a full, a full body, a full life that demonstrates Christ-like love. So Telemachus lived in what we consider the 4th and 5th century. To put that in years, he lived somewhere, was born in the the late 300s, and he died in the early 400s. So he lived about, you know, 400 or so years after Christ was born of Mary. Well, Telemachus lived in a day and age where it was popular for gladiators to fight in Roman amphitheaters. You know, we have all these movies out there where we make it really fanciful, where we go and we, we see these characters, they go, they put on their really cool armor, they're, they're, you know, Hollywood actors, so they're kind of like this nice, chiseled, jaw-looking man that's kind of the, the apex of what we wish we looked like, things of that nature. We kind of glorify it, but in truth, in the ancient world, gladiators were generally slaves. They were people who were captured from other nations. Um, sometimes they were just prisoners within the Roman Empire, and so you would have young men who were robbed from their family who would be forced to go out and fight to the death. You would have young ladies even that were taken and forced to fight to the death. Not only did they fight other people, they might be put up against 
you know, a Roman soldier who's meant to fight against them. It might be up against another prisoner. A lot of times they were up against rabid animals. Sometimes they were kind of up against contraptions and things like that where they might put someone on a griddle to burn them alive. A lot of the, the gladiator sport in the ancient world was a lot more brutal than we would think about it. You know, it's, it's one thing to think about it in Hollywood terms where it's really glorified, but then when you truthfully understand that it's just as likely to be a 19-year-old man as it is a 12-year-old girl who refused to go into a house of prostitution and now as a prisoner of Rome she's being forced to do this, you really start to understand it's a very, very wicked thing. And of course, even if you don't know all those details, it's still something which celebrates and glorifies death. So there's, there's that too, um, just on the very face of it. But in ancient Rome, there were a lot of people who went to the amphitheaters because it was a very popular form of entertainment. In fact, there were times in ancient Rome where you could pay a given fee and you can go and see so many people killed in the amphitheater. A bit like in our modern world, we have you know, monthly subscriptions to different TV services and things online where you can pay the monthly fee and see as much TV as you want. They had that in the ancient world when it came to the gladiators. Well, around the year 400, perhaps a little after, we don't know the exact date for sure, there was a man whose name was Telemachus. And Telemachus was a monk. And Telemachus, being a monk, he's sort of the guy that you think of when you think of soup kitchens, clothing the poor. You know, he kind of lives outside of society a little bit, maybe does some agricultural work, does the sort of things which are really meager and humble and aren't what you typically think of as being assertive or, or going to war or something of that nature. He was one who really understood that to, to be a man of peace, you kind of have to, to live in a little bit of peace. But he also knew that the call of the gospel is very, very serious. And to be a peacemaker also means you've got to be able to set aside your own comfort, your desire for everything to just be soup kitchens and clothing the poor, and step in to an arena where you very well likely will die a painful death in order to advance the gospel. Well, Telemachus, one day he happened to be near one of the amphitheaters and out of conviction of God was moved to go into the amphitheater. And he goes in there and sees that these gladiator games are going on, that they've got people that are being executed through these glorious sports where they're forced to fight to the death. Of course, it's designed to kill them in the end, so it's not like it's, it's really all that fair. But he goes in there and sees these gladiator games going on, and he, he's had enough of it. He's moved by the Holy Spirit that says, this is, this is terrible. We shouldn't be doing this as a people. And so Telemachus goes down from the stadium and enters into the arena, and he tries to break up the fight between the warriors who are fighting to death. And those who are in the crowds, they are so angry that their entertainment has been disrupted that they themselves get up from their seats and come clamoring down into the amphitheater after Telemachus. And no, 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 Telemachus is not ended just by being one of the, the fights or something going down there in the bottom of the theater, but the crowd is so angry they start picking up stones and everything and they bludgeon, they stone Telemachus to death there on the scene. Well, the story seems pretty tragic, right? We even think of, of John 15, 13, which says, No greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You might look at something like that and say, Well, Telemachus, where is the victory? You went and you just got into the battle of you know, the amphitheater for no reason, and you ended up being stoned. You know, The whole world was so angry at you, the people around you, everybody watching, they all disapproved of you to the point that they killed you. It'd be hard to make that decision. Well... In the days, the hours, the months, years after that, those who lived in Rome started to have some thoughts. Telemachus, who had been someone who was a monk, he had done so many you know, good, meager things in life. The fact that he was killed so brutally, the idea started to go around the Roman Empire that maybe these gladiator games are not, not so good. And so this whole methodology of taking what was mostly 
young men, young women, and putting them to death through these sports. Um, people who most likely did not commit legitimate crimes, but they were just, a lot of them were Christians just professing their faith. But these people being put to death like this, it all stopped when the culture saw Telemachus be martyred that way. Now, it didn't happen instantly. It took, you know, it took some time. But Telemachus' death on the cause of life there in the amphitheater so moved the Roman Empire that they stopped with the gladiator games. And so then, after we've had some time pass by and we go back to that verse, John 15, 13, which has no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, it didn't seem at first like that was an immediate victory, especially since people stoned the man. But a little while down the road, after people had time for their collective anger to go away, to cease being a mob after they had some time to think about this, and even the onlookers who, who watched this, people who were otherwise passive in the culture, they said, hey, we need to rise up and stop this from happening. So I wanted us to hear Telemachus' story because it has a couple of things we need to learn in it. One, if we want to make a difference in the culture around us, we need to understand that you may not be approved of when you do it. Just because people around you disagree with you doesn't actually mean you're wrong. We have developed in our, our minds over the course of generations, you know, we've developed some good instincts against danger, but we've also developed some instincts which don't always serve us so well. One of those is this whole idea that, well, if the group is doing it, you know, there's safety in numbers. If everybody else believes this, then I'll go along with it too. If you really want to be somebody who advances truth, you've got to be willing to stand with Jesus. And remember, there may not be many others who stand with you. A lot of people who you thought might stand with you may not. Jesus alone is the way to make you healthy and whole. And you've got to be willing to step down into the amphitheater. And even if they stone you, your life will be lost here on this earth. The price is really, really high. But the goodness of God is going to shine through in the end. We have to understand, if we want to, to deliver to our children a world better than the one we're living in now, we're going to have to be willing to take some risk. We're going to have to be willing to, to lose our jobs for what we believe. We're going to have to be willing to, to literally be punched in the face as much as figuratively. We're going to have to learn to take the pain and ultimately realize, as Jesus is going to say in Matthew chapter 10, um, fear not that which can touch the body, but the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So, we've got a lot of scriptures we're going to look at. We've got a lot of other topics we're going to talk about, too. They're all following this, this theme of mature Christian love, really getting into the love of Christ so that we can bring people to the freedom that's in Christ. Our world right now doesn't want people to be living in that freedom. It doesn't want people to know the truth of Jesus' love. It wants you to believe the things which are really passive, the things which are, are in truth perverted about Jesus' love, but they don't want you to see the full spectrum of it. They don't want you to understand that as much as Jesus does, in fact, feed the 5,000 through that miracle, he also casts out some demons and says no to some things. And, in fact, Jesus says no to a lot of things. He calls people out of their sin. All people are called out of their sin. So today, we're going to be looking at some passages, Old and New Testament, uh, we're going to be looking at Ezekiel 33 today, actually. And this is actually going to be quite a bit of fun in our studies. Our memory verse for today is going to be Ezekiel 33, 3. Though we're not going to write that down now. We've got a whole long program ahead of us, so we're going to come back to that towards the end. But I want us to talk about the watchman on the wall. That is Ezekiel. I know I've been talking about a lot of hot topics here lately. And... Some of you might think I've been a little bit too severe in some of the topics. Others might not think I've gone far enough. But we're here working through this. We've got to be men and women who are going to call out stuff in the culture. We've got to be men who are willing to be men and confront some of this stuff. And today we're going to go to Ezekiel 33, where Ezekiel is a watchman. 
The scripture reads, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him of their watchmen. All right. The Lord is saying, take someone and set them up as a watchman. Verse three, this is the scripture we're going to be uh, memorizing. We're going to record this with our own pens and papers. He says, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. All right, you heard that. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come, it will take him away. His blood shall be upon his own head. If he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon his head, own head. But he that taketh the warning, he, he is delivered with the warning for his soul. Now, I want us to read through that, and y'all forgive me. I'm out here, and I can't even focus my eyes on the Bible out here. So I've got a little bit of gap in my reading. But what we find here is that the Lord has called certain men to be watchmen. And in fact, this is something that we all need to be willing to do. Um, you can look at this text and say, while some people might have a specific job of being a watchman when there's stuff that's threats coming in, you know, whether you're the dog who originally perceives the stick as a threat, but then you kind of get comfortable to it. You need somebody to remind you that says, hey, that stick still might be a threat. Um, obviously, there might be some people who have that as a specific job, but God wants everybody to do this. If someone hears the sound of the watchman, they hear the warning and they ignore it, then their blood is on their own head. The punishment, the suffering that comes from that, that's on them. But if they hear that warning and they respect it, then they shall deliver their soul. Verse 6, it says, But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people not be warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Now this is where our scripture gets really, really important. Because in the church, we've got to be spiritually mature enough that says, yes, we are here to bind up the brokenhearted just as Jesus did. We are here to go out and bring people in with kind of the, the warm fuzzies, open arms. But if you think that is the full gospel and you cease to appreciate the importance of casting out evil, of calling out sin and informing people that sin is sin. You know, here the last few programs I talked about online a, a young lady who shared her testimony of being liberated from uh, homosexuality, from drug abuse, from thievery, from all of these things that make life miserable. And there were people in the church who rejected her testimony because they said homosexuality is not a sin. If people fail to call out sins that are sins, because again, this is not about a simple issue of, oh, we, we don't affirm someone's you know, natural desire, because again, all sin is naturally desirable, so therefore we hate them. It's not about that at all. It's about loving someone with enough maturity that says, we don't want you to be living in a miserable life that's separated from God, because a lot of these things that people try to step into that aren't as God designed them to be, they are miserable. They're ultimately not fulfilling. Whenever we fail to truly call people towards the standards God has given us, then it does lead people and leave them in a life of misery. And those in the church that deny those testimonies, that deny to tell people that sin is sin, the blood will be on their hands. The scripture is very serious. It's very severe. And even in the church, say it's a different issue. Um, say it's pertaining the issue of forgiveness and how we handle race in the, the modern day and age. There's a lot of people who don't want to forgive the sins of the past. They want to keep things alive. They want to tell people not to be colorblind. They want to say somebody who looks like you did something in the past, therefore we need to, you know, make you pay for those sins. First of all, if someone's asking you to pay for a sin you, you didn't commit, because trust me, we've committed all enough sins. We, we got enough sins on our own plate to pay for. But thankfully Jesus came and alleviated us of that. Um, but if somebody is, is trying to ask you to pay for something you're not responsible for, well, they can keep coming back and coming back and coming back to that will. You're never going to finish that, that thing. It's a worldview without forgiveness. It's bad. 
if we in the church permit stuff like this, if we allow it to be taught, whether in our pulpits, our classrooms, you know, if we allow this to stand in the culture around us, you know, we might think that we're being warm and fuzzy, that we're, we're being Christ-like because we're willing to feed the 5,000. But if we're not willing to call out the evil, then there's going to be, uh, well, it, it's not a good end for that. You've got to embrace the fullness of the gospel. Let's pick back up in verse 7. It says, So thou, son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to the wicked from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. Again, God says this twice to reinforce it. If you don't call out wickedness from wicked people, it's going to come back on you. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. This is a really beautiful text, by the way. It's not, again, I know I'm talking about a lot of the stuff. The world is going to tell you that someone like me is hateful. I'm not. I come from a place of pastoral love. If you're somebody out there afflicted by any of this stuff, um, or something I haven't even mentioned, but you've kind of bought into a lot of the lines of thinking that the world has told you, and you're feeling really hopeless because maybe politics hasn't worked out the way you want it to, the worldly movements didn't give you the results you wanted to, you saw some, somebody out there in the world that was your hero and they turned out not to be a hero, come, come to know Jesus. That is the place you will be healthy and whole. And say you're, you're in a church where, where they're not really preaching the gospel, you know, it's okay to leave and go to a place where the gospel is truly preached. Anywhere that doesn't call people from sin is not really doing the work of the church. And it's not going to make people happy. A lot of times there's been this idea that says, well, if we'll affirm them in their ways, they'll be at peace in life, they'll be healthy, their mind will be intact. It's not true, folks. It's all a lie to keep people from Jesus and to destroy their families. If we want to truly be living in peace, to be satisfied people who can truly have joy, then we've got to be restored to Jesus. We all have enough things in our lives to keep us broken. We don't need to buy into any of the false hopes of the world. Come to Jesus. He alone can make you healthy and whole. So we're going to go now to talk about a few more things. we got a lot on our program tonight. Um, actually, before we get into Matthew chapter 10, because we're going to read from that. Why don't we spend some time, I want to share with you a Facebook post I saw today. And it was regarding kind of the church and politics. Tractor going by. And I've got to say, I bought some lemon tea. When I'm out here preaching and whatnot, drinking the, the warm tea somehow helps my throat stay intact. I thought this lemon tea would be really good my goodness, it is nasty, but I guess I'm going to have to drink it. But earlier today, I saw a Facebook post that says, if we're asking a question about whether a, a Christian idea is right wing or left wing, we're in, the wrong, we're in the wrong place. We should be asking the question, does this idea help me love my neighbor? And you know what? There's a lot of things I like about that post. We don't need to, to think about everything with politics above the Christ-like love or things like that. And this idea that we should emphasize loving our neighbor, you know, that's very important. There's a lot of things I like about this post. But at the same time, there's a lot of things I don't like about it either. Kind of one of the read between the lines asserted premises here is that there's a lukewarm middle that sits in between left-wing politics and right-wing politics, and there in the middle is where the straight and narrow path is. It's not true. You know, evil is where evil goes. If evil is concentrated on the left in one point in time in history, then it's okay to call out the evil where the evil is. If you're in a different time in history and the evil is concentrated on the other side, it's okay to call it out if it's all over there. Evil is where evil goes. And that does not mean that the straight and narrow pathway of God's kingdom matches up with the world's middle. The world kind of does its own thing. 
this crazy idea that the middle ground of the earth is somehow the same middle ground, the straight and narrow pathway of God, that is, that is just ridiculous. That's really backwards thinking. Uh, but the other thing that, that really bothers me about this post is we in our modern world, I've seen it happen a lot that, that people come along and they say, well, you know, love your neighbor. But people don't know what that means. People in the church, a lot of the theologians with doctors next to their names don't know what it means. If you're out there listening to this and say you don't have a formal education and you think, well, you know, I got to trust those people who know more. A lot of them people are wrong. Throughout scripture, we find a lot of people who have those fancy credentials, the teachers of the law, they're wrong. We're all sinners in need of, of God. And don't matter how many credentials you got next to your name. I'm a pastor. I'm ordained in the church of the Nazarene. Let me tell you, being ordained does not sanctify you. Being ordained does not make you immune from sin. It doesn't make you any better than anyone else. Jesus makes you better. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you. We all need to be called from sin, and we all need to constantly be called from sin. The, the concept of love has been perverted in our culture. Sexual love has been perverted, um, but also neighborly love has been perverted too. When Jesus comes to us in the gospel according to St. John, he says, love your neighbor as I have loved you. He doesn't say love your neighbor as they want you to love them, as they need you to do to affirm them. He doesn't say love your neighbor as you want them. When Jesus says love your neighbor as you love yourself, he's not saying that you suddenly get to put yourself at the, the kingdom of God's you know, throne and sit there and dictate what love means. It, it means that you put the value in your life that you, over there with your neighbor as well. But the ultimate definition of love comes from Jesus. Jesus is the one who defines love. And we have a problem in our, our church where a lot of people, they are, they claim they're interested in love, but they're spiritually immature. And I have a test for that to see if you can tell if someone's really serious about Christian love or if they're doing the phony love that the world wants us to do. Are you doing real Christian love or are you doing some sort of perverted unchristian love? And the test for that is a simple question. Does your love believe in disciplining the victim? Now let me restate that because it sounds really harsh. Does your love believe in disciplining the victim? That sounds pretty brutal, doesn't it? But this will tell you whether or not people are sincere in their Christian love. The correct answer is yes. Mature, Christ-like love believes in disciplining those who are victims. Because guess what? We're all victims of the curse of death. We're all sinners in need of restoration. And yes, in life, people have had wildly and widely different circumstances. Some people have been subject to all kinds of abuse. They've been molested, they've been tortured, they've been tormented. I even know someone who is physically held captive for, several, um, for a very long period of time in her life against her will. But you know what? All of those people still have to repent if they really want to be free. And if we in the church, we really want people to be free, it's... It is very important to pull people out of bad situations, but guess what? They still need Jesus. They still need to be born again. And the people who aren't serious about Christian love, they will come along and they will call out people who are, say, oppressors or something like that. They love to talk about the language of who is the oppressed, who is the victim. And they want to focus all of their discipline and their correction and calling out towards the oppressors, but they don't ever want the victims to be released from their, well, victimhood. To be released from your victimhood, you've got to accept Jesus, you've got to have the Holy Spirit in your life, which means you've got to turn away from sin. And as harsh as it sounds, and this is me coming to you as a pastor with the love of Christ in my heart, people who are victims of sin they still have to turn away from their own sin. Yes, somebody may have committed a great evil against them, but then 
if they're ever to be freed, they've got to hand all over all of it to Jesus. Their own guilt that they had before and after, their victimization, and then even the sin that was done against them, they've got to hand it all to Jesus because he alone can make people born again. This test, this question that says, does your love believe in discipline for victims? That will tell you whether or not someone is really mature in their faith or they're, there's really only two other scenarios. They're either really immature in their faith and just haven't got there yet, or two, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're not really here to advance the gospel. Because if we want people to be free, let's take you know, any example. Let's, let's take an example of, of, say, someone who was abused as a child, sexually abused. People carry stuff like that throughout their life. You know, even the way that men and women think about sex is a little bit different. And, you know, for a young lady who might be of, have been abused as a child, that can really mess up their mind permanently. If they're ever to be freed from that, they need a transformation from God, which is going to include them repenting their own sins. Because, again, we're all naturally sinful. We all do little things that are sinful. Even the sins that are unrelated to that big act of violence that was done against them, they've got to repent of them. But then, with that big act of violence, they've got to hand that over to Jesus. They've got to hand that over to a loving God who will take all that is evil and throw it to a lake of fire. They've got to hand that over to the one who is really sovereign. And if we love people and really want to, to have people be freed, if we really want our brothers and sisters here on this earth around us, if we want them to be healthy and whole creatures, they've got to learn to turn it over to Jesus, everyone. There's a lot of people out there who have a fake version of love that's perverted that doesn't want to call people to that discipline. They don't want to call people out of sin. And these are the things that we find in Christian love. Clothe the poor. Let's love those who don't have a home. Let's give them a home. But there's another side that's inseparable. They're not like two sides where you get to pick and choose like you're at a buffet. Or me in there trying to pick out what drink I want to have and end up picking up the nasty tea. And so I, I may never drink it again. Who knows? It's not like this thing where you get to pick and choose. As much as we do clothe the poor, we also have to challenge sin. And all people have to be challenged out of their sin. Let's read Matthew 10, shall we? We're going to pick up in verse 5. We're going to read for a little bit. It says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and to any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And let's just, let's just take an understanding about what this means, because Jesus is telling them to go to a specific group of people, a specific ethnic group. A lot of people in our modern day and age would read that and say, Oh, Jesus is racist. That idea is nonsense. You know, God is sovereign. God can do what he wants to do. And God did choose to reveal himself by coming as a Jewish man in a Jewish people. But guess what? God did not do this so that he could turn away the rest of the world. In fact, he goes to all the Gentiles so that all may be born again. But in truth, when Jesus did come, he was there in the Jewish world. And these people don't have a lot of time. So he says, go to the people right around you. A big lesson we can learn from this is that in our day and age, you know, we have lost sheep in our own homes. We have lost sheep in our own family. We have lost sheep in our own friend circles. We have enemies that might live right across the street from us. We have to understand God has given us a lot of talents in life. And one of those talents are the people that sit around us. God has entrusted us with certain people. One of the great laws of the modern world is you don't need to focus on the people around you but instead focus on the big causes out there in the world. Focus on the people around you. Jesus says, go to the people around you. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, go to the lost sheep of your own house. This is a beautiful thing. Then he says, heal the sick, cleanse the leopards, raise the dead, cast out the devils. Freely you have received, freely you give. Again, this is exactly what I've been talking about. There are going to be people who are sick, people who are who are quite frankly gross and nobody wants to touch them because they got some nasty wound. You need to go over there and tend to them. You need to go over there and care for those people. You need to go over there and, and cleanse the lepers, give them a bath. At the same time, 
You're going to have enough faith in me that you're going to raise the dead. Also, you're going to cast out the devils. You're going to go over there to the people who are believing things they ought not be believing, the people who are advancing the doctrines of demons. You know, yesterday I talked about the Facebook devils. They're out there. There are plenty of them. Um, and then also the literal devils that are possessing people. Get them out. You can't pick and choose this. It's not all about soup kitchens. Christ-like love comes to people who may come to a soup kitchen and says, you got sin in your life? It's got to go. Because that's how you actually make people free. The devil hates freedom. He hates testimonies of freedom. You got to be willing to do that. Um, we're actually going to end there. We've been spending a little bit more time in all this. this is, that's really the, the verses I wanted to get to. But the rest of Matthew 10 is really beautiful. Uh, I encourage you to read it. It will remind you just how, how serious um, Christian love is. And I want us to flip back now to Ezekiel 33. And we're going to memorize Ezekiel 33.3. So if we'll flip over there. And we're memorizing this verse because we all need to learn to be a watchman. Ezekiel 33.3 reads, If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and more than the people. So let's write this. If, when, he seeth the sword He blow the trumpet and warn the people. If when he seeth the sword, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Now that's not a full sentence even. It's just a clause within one. But what we learn from this verse is that you out there, you have a responsibility to sound the alarm for evil. We do. And we do it out of love because we want our neighbors to be free. We want our children, our posterity to inherit a good world where they can exercise their faith. You know, as we prepare for Jesus to return to us, this verse is beautiful and it calls us to aspire to beautiful things. Well, it's time for us to get to our Revelation passage. And we're going to be jumping now from Revelation 9 into Revelation 10. And my oh my, did we get some beautiful stuff here. We're actually only going to be reading the first three verses. In this scripture it reads, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as if it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. Again, we got to get some, we got to get our, our backbone back. We got to get our, for those out there, the men in the church, we got to get our T level back. When these angels reveal themselves here in Revelation, they're powerful, powerful images. Because guess what? The, the love of God is a very powerful thing. It's a very dangerous thing. Pillars of fire, you know, you don't want to go up and run your hand in that. A face that's like the sun, you don't want to look at that, you'll go blonde. You know, clothed in a rainbow. As much as the modern world has tried to, to take the rainbow and turn it into something else, it's, it's a magnificent uh, image that comes from God. This, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And in verse 2 it says, And he laid in his hand, a little book open, and he sat his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Again, this is massive. This is like a just in, immaculate scene. He cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now I want us to just hold on to that image. So this, this angelic being comes. He's got this immense image. He's got one foot on the sea, one on the land, and when he cries out, it's like a lion roaring that is so powerful that the thunder of the sky roars in response. This is the God who loves you. This is the God who calls you to repentance. 
This is the God who wants you to be brought into his kingdom. This is what his warriors look like. This is what his angels look like. And he himself is more magnificent than all of them. It's a powerful thing. We need to appreciate the power of God to truly understand his love. And I know we've talked about a lot of things today. I kind of opened up with a dog story <laughs> that kind of had a little bit different tone from the rest of our program. But I want to go back to that because the main thrust and purpose for that story is that it's really easy to get comfortable with evil. You know, if enough people go along with it, you'll forget that sin is sin. You'll forget that evil is evil. But yet, even though we may not be able to call out sin as sin and evil as evil, we still find ourselves miserable because of the fact. A lot of people are trapped in their misery. The world does not want them to be free. False teachers don't want them to be free. Heretics don't want them to be free. The devils and the demons do not want them to be free. But God does. Christian love wants people to be free. It's very easy to be tricked into to liking evil. You know, like the dog. He started off being a little skeptical of it, like he should have been. But then before long, he was begging for it to stay. If you take that back scratcher and let it be a representation of evil, it doesn't take much for people to beg for evil to stay with them. They don't want it to leave. There are others in the world who think it's cute to see the evil pet somebody on the back. And they say, oh, let that stay. You're mean if you take that away from them. We're put on this earth for a time such as this. we got to have mature Christian love. we got to love our neighbors enough to, to bring them the gospel, our, our friends, our family, even our enemies, that they can all come into repentance. Because that's really at the heart of Christian love, repentance. This idea that if you will confess your sins, if you'll turn away from them, you can be free. You can be saved. I want us to think of that think about that. I want us to think on that powerful image in Revelation 10. I want us to think about our own lives. I want us to think about how one man like Telemachus back in ancient Rome can make such a huge difference. They can put down a whole thing of evil. He had to be willing to die in order to do that. He had to be willing to take a hit. I think we're going to find out very soon in the church just how many people are willing to stand with Jesus. You know, I know I talk about a lot of these social issues which are ultimately destructive. I really don't even... I, I don't know how long people are going to be confused on that because a lot of these evils their bankruptcy is becoming known. They're getting more and more predatory, like the, the sexualization of children to make that you know, public, where, hey, it's just another sexual appetite. It's okay if people want to, to do that. A lot of these ideas, these things which are evil, we're, we're seeing a change in our culture where no longer are we a predominantly Christian culture with you know, a few things festering beneath the surface. Now, we're a predominantly ungodly culture that is attacking Christianity because evil always hates the things which will make people free. We're going to start to see a lot more evil get a lot more dominant, get a lot more wicked. You know, it's going to feel comfortable putting its boot to the throat. Nebuchadnezzar's going to start constructing his furnaces and it's going to be very... Very easy for the world to throw people in those fiery furnaces. We're going to find out just how many people are really going to stand with Jesus. I, I, think, I think that's coming. It's coming very quickly. And I hope I'm wrong on that front, but there's no restraints in our culture to stop a lot of the ungodly beliefs. The only thing that can really stop it is going to be a mass revival in our culture. Um. There's a lot of people who kind of fantasize that, you know, the craziness will hit a point and people in mass are going to push back and suddenly America will snap back to how it was. I don't think that's going to happen based off of Scripture because, again, those who are faithful in little are faithful in much. If people were going to push back, they would have already been pushing back. 
yes, it is true that there does come a point where people's their eyes are open and they start to push back. But I think we're going to find out that it's it's not going to go as smoothly as, as perhaps some of us fantasize it would. We're going to find out just how many people are willing to stand near Jesus. When the Christ was put on the cross, you know, where are the twelve? There's a handful of women and you basically got two disciples, one who came by night, the other who was a secret disciple. People you would not expect to stand with Jesus, but they did. I think we're going to find out the real size of the Christian church. And um, we need to be prepared to understand in our lives we might be more like Telemachus than we realize. If you're really going to proclaim Jesus, you might find yourself in a place where you, you are largely alone, just you and God. A lot of the people that we rely on to come to our aid, they, for the last few years, they, they largely have not been coming. So build up your, friend, your family, build up your friends, and know on the Lord Christ Jesus and you will be saved. And my, oh my, how beautiful that freedom is. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that whoever is listening to this message, Lord, wherever we may be, that we may come to you. Lord, if, if anyone here in this audience is a non-believer, if there's someone who even wants to confront me and say that this message of the gospel is, is wicked, Lord, I pray that you soften their hearts. I pray that there would be an opportunity where, where I could speak with those people and we could, we could shine your light. I pray that those who are listening to this who are believers, that they will be comforted, they will be encouraged in their lives. They'll not ever be distracted or absorbed by any of the deceptions of the world, but instead they would be people of great courage, of great joy in life, that they would find peace even amidst the turmoil. Lord, let us find little things to be grateful for. We give you the, the thanks that says you gave us the breath of life, and even for that, we should give you praise every day. Bless us and keep us safe. We ask all this in the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. So thank you for joining me. The dog has run around the house, so we'll end there.